This video was made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Subscribe on Patreon for early access to videos and additional content. The 1930s was a titanic decade in world history. In 1930, the first Football World Cup occurred. That same year, Pluto was officially discovered and named, and superstar astronaut Buzz Aldrin was born. In later years, the Hindenburg explosion occurred, and famous pilot Amelia Earhart went missing. And of course, World War II began. But over the years, many of the decade's most compelling mysteries have long since been forgotten about. In today's video, we'll be exploring two baffling cold cases from the 1930s with no clues. But before we dive in, I want to thank Skillshare for sponsoring today's episode. A hunger for knowledge and wisdom is vital to living a good life. While we hope we are entertaining our viewers here at Cold Case Detective, we also want to educate and inspire. So maybe you'll seek out more information and discover new skills. And the very best place to do that is Skillshare. Skillshare is a digital education platform with creative-minded people at the focus, both behind the scenes and in the audience. Skillshare provides countless online courses for individuals from either technical or artistic backgrounds who seek new skills. These classes dive deep into art forms like graphic design and creative writing, or more mechanical areas such as UX design or web development. The best part is you can use Skillshare even if it's your first time trying out a new interest. The interface is designed for those just dabbling with activities without prior experience, and forces zero pressure on you to continue if it's not for you. CCD fans love to ask how they can shoot and edit their own YouTube videos, and via Skillshare, we found the perfect lesson called YouTube Success, Script, Shoot, and Edit with MKBHD, taught by Marcus Brownlee. Marcus does a phenomenal job showing you how to make a video from start to finish, and how to connect with an audience even if you've never gone to film school or don't already have thousands of subscribers. Through our sponsorship, the first 1,000 subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of the premium membership. And if you love it as much as us, you can sign up for just $10 a month on an annual membership after that trial ends, with fresh, ad-free lessons and loads more premium courses added every month. So take that step in building a wiser, smarter you. Join Skillshare today and help support CCD at the same time. And now let's dive in to today's cold cases. Barbara Follett. Born in Hanover, New Hampshire on March 4th of 1914, Barbara Newhall Follett seemed destined for greatness. Her father, Wilson, was a literary editor, critic, and university lecturer, while her mother, Helen, was a children's writer. It came as no surprise to either parent when Barbara began to exhibit a creative flair for writing following the start of her homeschooling sessions. The little girl excelled in writing and reading activities, and by the age of four, she had begun to write her own poetry. Barbara's writing often dealt with the themes of nature and the wilderness. Her first novel, The House Without Windows, revolved around a young girl who ran away from home to live in nature with the animals. The book was published in 1927, when Barbara was just 12 years old, and it was praised up and down the nation. Her second book was published when she was just 14, and, once again, was critically acclaimed. However, despite her promising career, vivid imagination, and endless talent, Barbara was living under a cloud. In the lead-up to her parents' separation in 1928, her father had begun to spend more and more time in New York, where he'd met and fallen for a woman 20 years his junior. 
The separation of her parents devastated Barbara, who was very close to her father. Reportedly, he was the biggest supporter of her creative endeavors, and he essentially abandoned her following the divorce. Not willing to quit just yet, however, Barbara encouraged her mother to start anew. Helen placed her other daughter, Sabra, into the care of a family member before she and Barbara headed off to start a new adventure, sailing from New York to Barbados and exploring the Caribbean islands. While traveling to Washington in 1929, Barbara met 25-year-old Edward Anderson. He became her closest companion, and Barbara ultimately fell in love with him. But the relationship Barbara wanted never took off, and she returned to the US with her mother. From here, she enrolled in university, but quickly decided it wasn't for her and ran away to San Francisco. By all accounts, Barbara appears to have led a turbulent life as a teenager and young adult. By the age of 16, she was working as a secretary in New York City. She continued to write manuscripts, but had fallen out of favor with publishers, meaning her newer work never saw the light of day. In July of 1934, she married Nickerson Rogers. The pair had met in the summer of 1931 while traveling across Europe. At last, the young woman seemed fulfilled and happy, but this euphoria did not last long. Just a few years later, in 1937, Barbara began to express her dissatisfaction with the marriage. In 1938, she began to suspect Rogers of having an affair and became increasingly distressed by the notion. On December 7th of 1939, Barbara, now 25, left the home she shared with her husband in Massachusetts and was never seen or heard from again. According to Rogers, he and his wife argued and she left. She never came back and took with her $30, the modern day equivalent of about $558 and a single notebook. All of her documents, manuscripts and other personal possessions were left behind. However, Rogers did not report her missing until two weeks later, claiming that he was waiting for her to return. It is possible that the couple had argued because Rogers had asked Barbara for a divorce, but we don't know this for certain. Four months later, Rogers asked the authorities to issue a missing person bulletin, but it was done under her married name, so the media did not pick up the case. Rogers also reportedly declined to publicize the case further, but this could have been due to Barbara's bad track record with the media. News outlets didn't actually pick up on her story until 1966. In 1941, Rogers reportedly attempted to divorce Barbara on the grounds of cruelty, but this was unsuccessful. However, he did eventually manage to get a divorce in 1944 and remarried shortly after. According to one of his daughters, Rogers hired a private investigator to help locate Barbara, but the investigator found no signs of the missing 25-year-old. In 1952, Barbara's mother, Helen, pushed for more to be done in her daughter's case. She suspected Rogers of being involved and even wrote him a letter that said, quote, all of this silence on your part looks as if you had something to hide concerning Barbara's disappearance. She told him that she would do everything in her power to find out whether Barbara was dead or alive and where she was. Authorities never found a trace of Barbara after her disappearance. It has been theorized that she left to start a new life somewhere else. After all, she seemed to be an independent woman who loved adventure. It has also been speculated that she left to take her own life, given her history of depression. One Reddit user poignantly noted that Barbara may have seen her husband's distant, cool behavior as an echo of her father's abandonment, which may have caused her great emotional distress. It's also been pointed out that her first love, Edward, passed away in 1937, and this may have added to the heartache. On November 25th, 1948, a hunter found human remains in Mount Prospect Woods, which overlooked Squam Lake in New Hampshire. Barbara was fond of the area and had stayed in a nearby farmhouse with Rogers several times. The remains were skeletal and some parts were missing, 
likely due to the weather and scavenging animals, but authorities were able to determine that they belonged to a woman in her mid-twenties, and that the skeleton had been there since at least 1939. For their part, law enforcement determined that the remains were those of a 25-year-old pregnant woman named Elsie Whitmore who'd gone missing from Plymouth in 1936. However, there has been some speculation that the remains actually belonged to Barbara due to the discrepancies between the skeleton and Elsie. The oddities are as follows. 1. Glasses were recovered from the scene, but Elsie did not wear glasses. 2. A size 7 shoe was found along with the body, but Elsie wore a 5 or a 5.5. 3. No belongings from the scene could be identified by Elsie's family. It's also been noted that the Plymouth girl was in the later stages of pregnancy at the time of her vanishing, yet there was no indication in these remains that the body was of someone who was pregnant. And 4. A water flask and a medicine bottle containing traces of barbiturates were found at the scene. As a result, investigators believed that Jane Doe had taken her own life. And wouldn't you know, Barbara was known to have been prescribed barbiturates for her disordered sleeping pattern. No death certificate for Elsie was ever released, and her family never received the bones for burial. In fact, her family never really accepted the remains were hers. There is also no indication as to where the bones were buried or where they went. Their location to this day is unknown. Investigators closed their investigation roughly one week after the remains were found, satisfied with their conclusion that the body belonged to Elsie. There is much discussion online as to whether or not the bones belong to the 25-year-old, but without the remains, Barbara's descendants cannot conduct DNA testing to confirm or debunk the notion. No trace of Barbara has ever been found in the years since her sudden disappearance, and there has never been any evidence to indicate or exclude foul play. To this very day, her vanishing remains a strange mystery. Marjorie West Perhaps one of Pennsylvania's most well-known cases is that of four-year-old Marjorie West. Marjorie was born to Shirley and Cecilia West on June 2nd of 1933 in Bradford, Pennsylvania. She had two siblings named Dorothea and Alan and was the youngest of the three. Her father, Shirley, was an assistant engineer at Kendall Refining. On the morning of May 8th, 1938, the West family attended church services in Bradford. Afterwards, they decided to go for a picnic to celebrate Mother's Day. They were accompanied by another couple, Mr. and Mrs. Ackerland, and drove about 13 miles along Highway 219 to Allegheny Forest, where they enjoyed the sunshine and relaxed. At around 3 p.m., Shirley, seven-year-old Alan, and Lloyd Ackerland went fishing in the nearby stream. Cecilia returned to the car for a rest, while Dorothea, 11 years old, along with Marjorie, collected flowers by the creek. At one point, Dorothea decided to present her mother with the flowers she picked, so she headed off. When she turned back, Marjorie was gone. The family, accompanied by their friends, attempted to search for the little girl, but found no sign of her, so they drove for seven miles until they found a bar. From here, they contacted the local police department. Upon arriving on the scene, authorities immediately suspected that the four-year-old had fallen into a well. There were many of them dotted around the area due to an oil boom in the 1870s. However, the wells were checked and the area, including the secluded forest, was thoroughly combed, yet it turned up no new leads. Scent dogs found nothing of interest and the search grew bigger involving 3,000 locals and 500 police officers. Witnesses came forward to law enforcement and reported seeing two cars drive past the site shortly before the time of Marjorie's vanishing, but the vehicles were traced and ruled out. Searchers eventually stumbled upon a fresh grave in the woods, but when they dug it up, they found only caskets of wine and a scrap of lace. 
The lace was at first thought to have belonged to the little girl, but her family described her as wearing a blue dress, a navy mid-length coat with the collar edged in pink, a red Shirley Temple style hat, and leather shoes. In other words, Marjorie wasn't wearing any lace when she vanished. Then a taxi driver came forward with a strange tale of his own. He told law enforcement that on the evening that Marjorie disappeared, he saw a girl resembling her in Thomas, West Virginia. The girl who had the four-year-old's red curls and wore similar clothing was crying. She was riding in a dark green sedan with an unidentified man in his late 30s. At around 11.38 PM, the man stopped to ask the taxi driver where the nearest motel was located. The witness pointed out the nearest one, but the pair came back because the motel had no vacancies. Then the man asked for a local liquor store. The witness told him there was one down the road. Then, days later, a man who matched the description given by the taxi driver was seen by a gas station attendant as he refueled his car. The attendant noticed that in the back of the vehicle, there was a bundle wrapped in a gray blanket. At first, this seemed like a major break in the case. Authorities theorized that if Marjorie had been taken at around 3 PM, it would have taken the perpetrator about eight hours to reach Thomas. So they would have arrived between 11 and 11.30 PM, matching up with the witness statement. However, authorities were able to track the man down. He was the father of the little girl and was a merchant. The pair were trying to get home, but had to stop driving because of the thick fog that night. The little girl, who was either five or six, had been upset because she was frustrated at not being able to go home. Although the girl did look similar to Marjorie, police determined that the pair had nothing to do with the investigation, and she was not the missing four-year-old. However, it's unclear if the gas station attendant saw this same man or not. At one point, a 55-year-old woodsman who was never publicly identified was questioned in connection with the case. However, it was soon found that the man had nothing to do with the disappearance, and he was ultimately released from police custody. He has never been named as a suspect. Although there are very few clues in Marjorie's case, there are a lot of theories. As the four-year-old was out in the middle of a forest, it seems very likely that whatever happened to her was accidental. Online sleuths have suggested that perhaps she fell into the creek and was swept away by the water. Others have noted that she may have become prey to the wildlife or that she wandered off, got lost, and tragically succumbed to the elements. For a short period of time, there was some speculation that she had been taken to Canada by other family members. Another theory in Marjorie's case is that she became the victim of an illegal adoption ring. At the time, child abductors for profit were not uncommon. A woman in Tennessee named Georgia Tan was well known for her kindness and generosity. She operated a facility that placed at-risk children into adoptive homes. However, it later emerged that Georgia had actually been kidnapping children from poor families and selling them to the rich as a way of bypassing the entire proper adoption procedure and securing herself financial wealth. In 1998, a writer named Harold Thomas Beck began to look into the case, which he'd heard of during his days working as a barman. Using the internet, which was in its infancy at the time, Beck posted photos of Dorothea online and offered a $10,000 reward for anyone with information leading to Marjorie's whereabouts. Beck had posted the photos in the assumption that the sisters would look alike at their older age. Incredibly, Beck got a hit. A woman in Florida contacted him, saying she worked with a woman who was a nurse who resembled Dorothea. Beck then traveled to meet the woman, who even more surprisingly claimed to be Marjorie. The woman told him that on that day, in May of 1938, she had been hit by a car driven by a man who was driving past the forest while on his way to his farm in North Carolina. He'd been working temporarily at an oil refinery in Pennsylvania. After knocking down Marjorie, the man, who the woman referred to as her father, placed her in the back of his car to take her to the hospital. However, Marjorie awoke during the trip 
and the man decided to take her back home to his grieving wife. The couple had lost their own daughter to an illness a short time before the accident. Reportedly, as she grew up, Marjorie still had memories from her former life and would ask her parents about it, but they would always dismiss her. The woman swore Beck to secrecy, but said she wanted to meet Dorothea. Unfortunately, Dorothea had taken ill around this same time and was too unwell to meet the woman. Dorothea passed away in 2007, and DNA testing was never conducted. Beck revealed the woman's name following her death and ended up writing a book on the entire situation, which several of Marjorie's descendants have dismissed as essentially a cash grab. In 2010, descendants of Marjorie's reached out to law enforcement, who started a new case file. Reportedly, the old one had been destroyed once the case reached the 75 year mark. The search for Marjorie West was the largest one undertaken by authorities since the Lindbergh baby kidnapping of 1932. Her case is the second oldest one in the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's database, and yet it still remains unsolved. There has never been any trace of Marjorie in the years since her vanishing. If she is still alive, she will be 88 years old. If you have any information about her case, you can contact the Pennsylvania State Police at 814-938-0510. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon, for early access to our monthly documentaries and too close to home investigations. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.